My name is Lisa Chase and I'm a professor at University of Vermont Extension and I'm the director of the Vermont Tourism Research Center. Today we are discussing farm-based education. This virtual gathering is the fifth in a series leading up to the International Workshop on Agritourism, which will take place in Vermont in person in August of 2022. That's new. Last month I said 2021. You heard it here first, we are postponing the in-person conference for another year in hopes that global travel, global travel will be fully back um, by 2022. In the meantime, we're going to do everything we can to keep connecting virtually. So we'll keep going with these monthly gatherings, looking at a variety of different topics, and we're also looking into other creative ways to connect. So if you have ideas, please let me know. We, um, we don't want to just hit pause on all the excellent work and information and resources and research that's going on. Um, we want to keep sharing and keep building the network. A major sponsor for this conference and for the virtual gatherings is Yonder, which is a new booking site that promotes farm stays and other nature rich guest experiences. Founded and advised by farmers, Yonder highlights stewards or hosts that have a connection to their local community, practice environmental responsibility, and exhibit hospitality that's reflective of this commitment. Through the Yonder site and app, guests can discover and book overnight stays and activities at farms in the US, and pretty soon in Europe as well. Yonder is expanding around the world. They started in the US, but they're expanding in the world, around the world, and they are a very important partner for this international network that was launched at the first World Congress on Agritourism back in 2018 in Italy. That conference was organized by UREC Research and we're continuing to build this network through the virtual gatherings like the one we have today. In just a moment, we're gonna dive into today's discussion on farm-based education. But first, I want to get a sense of who is here with us. So I'm going to launch a poll. You should see on your screen a question that says, describe yourself, check all that apply. And feel free to click as many boxes as you want. Uh, while you're filling that out, I'll, I'll mention that we had around 300 people registered um, for this gathering, um, representing about 30 different countries. It has been really um, exciting to see the participation that we've been getting on these gatherings. And while we so miss meeting all of you in person, um, we're, we're waiting anxiously for a time, hopefully 2022, when it's safe for travel and we can all meet up in Vermont. And in the meantime, thank you for joining us today. One of my as nice as it is to be able to do something, at least virtually, I do miss being able to see who everybody is and really get to know you. So um, if you, if, for those of you who did click other in the poll, I'm gonna end the poll and launch the results now. So you should see on your screen that, not surprisingly, since we're talking about farm-based education, um, educators are about 38%. And we've got quite a good mix of producers, farmer ranchers, service providers, nonprofits, government agencies, researchers, tourism professionals, and business owners and managers. Feel free to right now take a moment to type into the chat. Let us know who you are and where you're from. I have the fortune to see the, the registration information where I appreciate how many of you put in, put in questions and put in so much interesting information about the work you're doing and where you're from. Unfortunately, you all can't see that information. So feel free to type in chat and let us know who you are and what kind of work you do and what you're hoping to get out of this uh, session today. And remember, if you do have specific questions for the panelists, please put that in the Q&A because sometimes the chat gets so busy, it gets uh, hard to keep up with.
I now want to introduce our moderator. Vera Simon Nobes is a mom, gardener, and farm based educator who comes from a family of teachers. In 2013, she became the farm based education network coordinator at Shelburne Farms, which is a nonprofit farm and education for sustainability organization based on unceded Abenaki land in Shelburne, Vermont. For those of you who are planning to come to Vermont for the conference in 2022, make sure Shelburne Farms is on your list of places to visit. Vera believes the farms are the best places for relationship building and connecting with oneself and the ecological communities that support us, and that everyone has a right to these opportunities. I have been very fortunate to work with Vera for, boy, it's been quite a few years now, and I have learned so much um, from working with Vera. So thank you so much for joining us today and leading this session. Thank you, Lisa. I echo that back. I have so much respect for what you do with the agritourism community. And thank you so much to everyone who's joining. It's really amazing seeing the chat, um, chat box light up with some familiar faces and not faces, some familiar names and organizations. So thank you everybody for being here. And most of all, thanks so much to the panelists. Um, let's see, so as Lisa said, I come from uh, the Farm-Based Education Network. Um, we're a free member network. And so if anybody is interested in joining um, to see more of what we're doing, the link is in the chat box. Um, right now we're doing all virtual programming, which uh, has been a real silver lining for us because we are able to connect with so many people across the world. Um, and I just wanna uh, reiterate or, or say for the first time that I'm really open to hearing what themes from today resonate with you all, the audience. And if there are things that you'd like to touch on again later in 2021, I mean, it would be really fun to come back together in another virtual space to dig deeper into specific um, things that you hear today. So feel free to reach out at any point. Um, I'm so honored to be here with these panelists and my main goal for this, this panel today is to really um, listen more than speak. And so I think we're gonna dive right in. Uh, we have some excellent speakers and some beautiful projects represented and the first round of questions here is going to be a pretty quick sort of introductions from each um, panelist and then we'll move into a bit longer um, question and answer period where we get to hear a little bit more about their programs. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Jen Rothman. Jen has over 20 years of experience building programs for museums, gardens, and farms. Prior to joining the Yellow Farmhouse Education Center in Connecticut, she was the education director at Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture. For food and agriculture. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much, Vera. Um, we were asked to sort of start with an aha moment um, or, or some way that we got to the farm-based education world. And so I actually wanted to preface that with a writing prompt as a, as a potential way to engage us in, in conversation. Um, this is a prompt that we use often in person, but also virtually, and it's a favorite of mine uh, to use as an icebreaker. Um, and I think if, um, if you want to include in the chat your responses to it, that would be wonderful. And I think we'll revisit it at the end as well. Um, but what I, what I ask um, students or teachers or participants to do is to think of a fruit or vegetable or food that best represents you and why. And so as an example and as a way of introduction, I will use an avocado today to introduce myself. Um, uh, it changes pretty often for me which food I choose, but let's say today, avocado. Um, and uh, I would say I chose an avocado because I tend to have a thick skin. It takes a lot to, to bother me. Um, I can be pretty soft and welcoming um, to people and ideas, um, but I'm also pretty strong um, on the inside and, and, and stick to my convictions. So that's how I would introduce myself. Um, but I like this activity because it, it's really connected to my background as a museum educator. Um, I knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, but as I got older and following my experience learning outdoors through my environmental studies program, um, I realized that informal education was a much better fit for me. Um, and so after working at um, some children's museums and aquariums, I um, enrolled in a museum studies program. And um, 
uh, and, and after graduating began working at a, a botanical garden. Um, but as a museum educator, you're taught to help people make connections and build meaning through objects and experiences. Um, you're always looking for that way in, for that way to find a spark where somebody's kind of getting it all of a sudden. Um, and when I began teaching about plants and ecosystems, I realized it started to get a little bit easier than working with, let's say, uh, an object in an in a, in a art gallery, for example. Um, and it was definitely an aha moment for me, um, especially when I then began working with edible plants and food. All of a sudden, the connections were like right there and tangible and, and people got it right away. And um, they were able to access purpose and meaning in the learning experiences that I was working on. And it sort of clicked for me that my love of cooking, uh, my environmental science background, and my passion for teaching were really perfect. Per perfectly matched uh, for a future in farm-based education. Um, and that's what led me to, to my work at Stone Barn Center and to now at the Yellow Farmhouse Education Center. Thanks, Jen. And again, we'll be hearing more from each panelist um, as, we, as we get to know each other and each other's stories a little bit more. Um, Lusanda is next. Lusanda Mwake is an admitted attorney who holds a master's in commercial law from the University of Cape Town. Lusanda's passion for education and in youth empowerment saw her founding Dream Factory Foundation in 2011, an award-winning organization that empowers young people through education, equipping them with skills and creating, mean to, and creating meaningful opportunities to become active citizens living purpose-driven lives. Welcome, Lusanda. Thanks, Vera. You didn't do too badly on my surname there. I'm so proud. <laughs> Hello everyone and I want to actually just do a shout out to Nicholas because they are from Woodstock which is like 10 minutes from me where I am at the moment so it's just so such a sweet gift for me that there's someone here or in the city where I am so basically um, as Vera said my name is Lusanda and I'm originally from South Africa but in 2018 my husband um, passionately wanted to go back home, which is in Botswana. And what a transformative experience, you know, from a township girl who went into the city in Cape Town, who now transformed her life by living in a village. Um, but it's those transformative um, situations that turn into great opportunities because I saw it as an opportunity to extend our impact as Dream Factory Foundation um, where we launched an um, initiative called Adopted a Village, um, which, um, which is what we're doing, which is, I guess, relevant to our discussion today, which is around how we can use farming to basically um, build the economy of an, of an environment, build the people, and at the same time, educate them in very innovative and yet um, um, ways that they, they very much know and, and do on a daily basis. So... I'm so privileged to be here today. Thanks, Lusanda. Tony Van Winkle is the director of the Ryan Freed Center for Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems at Sterling College in Prestbury Common, Vermont. His personal and professional interest, interests reflect an abiding fascination with the spirit of place, wherever that happens to be. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Very happy to be here. So. Um, my, my background in entry is somewhat similar to, to Jennifer's. I, um, education has been sort of, you know, the, the place I have begun from, I guess you could say. And um, at the uh, master's level, I pursued a degree that focused on traditional arts, material culture, cultural landscapes that uh, basically landed me in the historic preservation field. And at about that same time, my partner and I had started our first kind of commercial farming venture. Uh, this is in a kind of a very small, you know, sustainable, diversified vegetable farm, basically a truck farm more or less in Tennessee. Um, we became involved there also in kind of farming and food activism, you know, urban farming, uh, community gardens and that sort of thing. Um, and what I realized through this combination, this kind of confluence of uh, my sort of public history career and my farming career was that you know, in my work day to day, I would go out and document historic properties and historic landscapes. And what I was supposed to be documenting was buildings primarily. 
Um, but what I quickly realized was that I was much more interested in the plants and they became distracting from my primary focus, which was supposed to be on buildings. Um, so the plants became more interesting to me, the farm, the field patterns and things like that. Um, eventually those two things sort of synergized and I decided to go back and get another advanced degree and um, where I studied anthropology, particularly the anthropology of food and farming, focused a good bit on uh, agrobiodiversity and also local food movements, always with a passion for education throughout, you know, that was kind of, again, the foundation of, of my professional life, really. And um, I guess somewhere along the way, I realized that, you know, this emerging passion for seed stewardship, which is a central part of what I do now um, as an educator and as uh, avocationally as well, um, was it seed stewardship and seed conservation probably come from the same root or impulse that led me to the historic preservation career and they weren't necessarily that divergent. Um, and that teaching about those things um, and also keeping a foothold in being a practitioner as a small scale farmer um, have guided my life since and Sterling College has really uh, provided me with the context in which all those things can be realized in, in a co coherent whole. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. So thank you, I'm very, very happy to be here. Thanks, Tony. And now um, we'll hear from Gwyneth Harris. Gwyneth is a farm manager and faculty at Sterling College in Craftsbury, Vermont. Gwyneth has been gardening for as long as she can remember and finds limitless opportunities for creativity in farming. Welcome, Gwyneth. Oh, you're muted, Gwyneth. Great, so I've, I've now been at Sterling in some um, farm management position for about 13 years, almost 11 in my current position. Um, and I first set foot on the Sterling farm in 1997. So I have a long history with this organization and I wanted to, as introduction, talk about a few moments in my life that kind of got me to this point and um, have continued to bring me back here to this work in agricultural education. Um, I think unlike some of the other folks on the panel, I came to this work from, more from the farming direction. Um, I think I started out my early life thinking I wanted to be a scientist and then realized that what I really liked was the application of those principles um, and productive work around scientific principles. So, um, the first moment I wanted to talk about was my first day of my second college career after I had dropped out once. Um, I walked into a group advising meeting and it was there that I first heard the term agricultural education. And I, it wasn't something I had ever even thought was a possibility. Um, and it wasn't, it would take me quite a long time to kind of develop my own definition of that term, but it certainly resonated with me. And so um, it was something that I, I took with me into my college experience. The, the next moment was my first interview for a position at Sterling College, which was in 1997. And um, the dean of the college was talking about what Sterling did, and he started to talk about work as not drudgery, but something that was dignified and immersive and expansive and as a way to learn about our world. And it suddenly made me feel like what I like to do, which was be outside and be working with plants and animals was an okay way to learn that it, it wasn't, um, it shouldn't be minimalized and that it was uh, valuable. So um, the third moment was after the first time I quit my job at Sterling. <laughs> and I think this moment was the one that eventually led me back to Sterling in particular and to agricultural education in general. And I think it was around 2 p.m. And it was my first day and I'd been at a computer all day. And I realized I'd made a terrible mistake. <laughs> um, what I was doing was simple, you know, the task was not complicated. 
it wasn't even really that boring, but I missed having a farm to work on. I missed the diversity that a farm brings to work. And I missed the different tasks, settings, organisms, all the different co-workers and co-learners that I worked with. And I knew that I needed to get back to that type of education as soon as possible. And eventually made it here. <laughs> Thanks, Gwyneth. I'm sure a lot of people are agreeing with you out there. I can relate to that. Um, Connor is our, is our final panelist. Um, Connor is a queer forager and uncle. He joined Farm School NYC in autumn 2016 and continues to grow more in love with the Farm School community each season. And Connor, I just realized I don't know your last name, so you'll have to share that as well. All good. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Connor Vaughn. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and alt pronouns. And I'm here representing Farm School NYC, uh, where I've been working as program coordinator for the past four years. Uh, we're based in New York City on Lenape land. And yeah, here to share a little bit about my story and our organization here today. So part of my story of getting to farm-based education goes back to a moment when I was working on a, a summer camp in the Hudson Valley on a farm and eating the food that was grown on the land was a really transformative experience for me and kind of like my aha moment of leading me to where I am today. So years later, I, I found myself working in New York City. Uh, kind of similarly to Gwyneth, I was thinking of like, what is what I'm doing now? How is that serving me and serving my myself and my spirit? And I, I realized I needed to get more back into uh, values aligned work. So I made a list of everything that I wanted to be doing and realized that that was uh, really more in alignment with working with the land and working in communities uh, based upon whatever I was doing at the time in New York City. And so that's how I found my, my current role, getting back into the farming world, thinking about that experience, eating the food uh, from the land where I was working uh, in the Hudson Valley in New York that summer many years ago. And yeah, so I got involved with different farms and growing organizations in New York City and have always been involved in education and eventually found myself uh, with the opportunity to work in community with Farm School NYC, uh, as I mentioned, where I've been program coordinator for the past four years. I really love the community of Farm School and I'm happy to share more later, uh, but just really want to underscore the the inspiring feeling I have um, being in service to this community and working with really wonderful folks. Um, so great to meet you all today and looking forward to sharing more. Thanks. And now I want to invite people to use the chat box to echo back something that you heard in these introductions that really resonated with you. So that could be a word, a sentence, um, a thought, really, what, however that, that lands with you, feel free to drop something into the chat box or just reflect quietly with yourself about um, something that you connected with, with these folks. And can I just jump in to say that when you type into the chat box, if you're willing to share with attendees too, it says, when you look at the chat, it says two, and you can select all panelists and attendees. Um, Please, if you're willing, share widely with everyone. We love seeing what you're writing, but I think everyone else will as well. I can also read a couple of them in case, uh, so what I'm seeing is strong desire to work in relationship with land and people, a calling back to the land, values aligned work, values aligned work. Um, sitting at a computer all day, which is ironically what I'm doing right now. We didn't say a reminder to folks about really coming into the space however you need to be here. So if you are, um, wrangling kids or cooking lunch or um, stretching while you're on this webinar that's all welcome here of course um, we heard the spark when teaching about edible plants from Jennifer service we heard connection to land and community um, something from what Lusanda said transformative experiences can be very beneficial for our lives Somebody in the chat box also mentioned a cousin who attended Sterling College and was really formative in that person getting into agriculture. So I also just want to remind people to take time today, either during this panel or later today, to just think about who those mentors are who have guided you to show up today at this webinar, to 
be just getting into the field of farm-based education or to be um, feeling like you're more settled in this really wonderful field of work. Um, thanks, it's, it's great seeing, seeing these panelists, or seeing these um, chats. Um, so we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into what the work is that these wonderful panelists are representing. Um, you heard some intro sort of about how, who they are and how they've come into this field. And now we're gonna turn it back over to them to hear more about their organization, their mission, a little bit about the size and scale of their, their organization, and also maybe even about their organization's culture. Um, and I think we'll go in that same order. So Jen, I know you have a few slides. If you wanna get those ready, we'll, we'll start with you. Excellent. Okay, you can see those, right? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I'm so honored to be part of this conversation um, with so many amazing people, both um, panelists and in the chat as we see everybody's comments come in. Um, I'm the founding director of the Yellow Farmhouse Education Center. Um, I began the organization about three years ago. We're pretty small um, still, but um, we, I, I started it shortly after my family and I um, decided to relocate to the Mystic Stonington area. Our mission is to use culinary and farm-based education to connect people to each other and to where their food comes from. And we strive to cultivate a shared investment in a sustainable and just food system. We're located at Stoneacres Farm, which is on unceded Pequot and Mohican land. Um, it's on the coast, uh, southeastern coast of Connecticut. Um, so we have this really lovely connection to the land and to the sea. Um, Stone Acres Farm is a 68 acre uh, farm with about 10 acres that are in vegetable and egg production. And the Yellow Farmhouse is a nonprofit organization that leases space from Stone Acres Farm to do our programs. Um, in addition to the farming areas, uh, there's also uh, garden spaces, uh, woodlands that we use for educational programs, um, but also the space is used for weddings and events, dinners, things like that as well. Um, and then this is the Yellow Farmhouse, which um, is where we got our name from. So this is where our organization is housed out of, um, and we use this space for programming, um, and then of course the rest of the farm as well. Um, one of our sort of core values and what we believe in is that when you combine education um, with emotional connection, it can lead to behavior change. Um, and so we're seeking to, through our programming, create new memories and tap into existing food memories that we think um, will help people be open more to learning about food production, about regenerative farming, about how our food system works, and also how it doesn't work. Um, but it starts, I believe, with an emotional connection. Um, and so some of the ways that that um, sort of is realized through our programming is through programs with little kids as young as three. We do a lot of intergenerational cooking programs, um, which gives people an opportunity to cook together um, in our kitchen, um, bring them out onto the farm, um, and create positive associations with cooking, with farming, with food. Um, this also could look like um, kids out on the farm participating in a harvest or a farming activity. We do welcome school groups to the farm. Um, we uh, welcome groups as young, you know, from preschool, but uh, all the way up through high school as well. And our, our programs with schools, um, we try to always include a cooking and uh, a meal a piece of it as well. We feel that we want people out on the farm, but we also want them cooking. We also want them sitting and sharing meals and building community around that experience. Um, the conversations that happen over the lunches that we have together are probably the best ones that we have all day. Uh, when students or any adults visit our farm, um, we do tr try to have them engage in a, an authentic farming experience. So that uh, usually involves me talking to, with our farmer in the morning and asking what has to happen today. I've got 25 people coming to the farm. What can we be helpful with? So not something that's going to be taking away from their work, but really something um, that's going to support the work of our farmers. And for example, one, one uh, group of teachers that we had visit the farm collected rocks for several hours because we just needed to clear a field of rocks. And so we, we went rock harvesting, we called it. 
Um, you know, we, we've also built a barn with a group of teachers. We had a barn raising event. Um, but in this case, in this picture, it is a group of students that were crating up squash that were out in the fields to cure. And so it was spread out throughout the field and our farmer asked if they could just crate it up and bring it um, and set it up in a line so that we could, so he could swing by with the tractor and pick up all of the crates and, and it saved, you know, hours of work. And the students really felt that they had been part of and been useful and of service to the farm. We do a lot of work with teachers. We have a, a pretty robust uh, professional development program. Um, we work quite a bit with family and consumer science teachers, which are like the home ec teachers and the culinary teachers in the schools, um, who um, I think are sort of this new generation of family consumer science teachers that are looking to um, maybe not just teach about baking uh, cupcakes, let's say, but teaching about where the flour came from that was used to bake the cupcakes and how it was grown and what is a seed and where is that seed come from and and was that seed um, genetically modified? But, you know, and, and really sort of delving deep into all of these different um, topics with just baking cupcakes. And with all of the work that we're doing with teachers, we're really, and this goes back to the museum piece of me, is, is trying to find those connections. So whether that is talking about um, gender as it relates to butter making on farms historically, or talking about, um, um, how to measure a field and connecting it to a math lesson, um, but really seeing how can we push food and farming into any curriculum area um, th throughout the school day to help teachers build connections and bring their lessons to life. We also welcome adults to the farm through um, corporate events and programs um, and also just through lectures and, and conversations. With the pandemic, of course, we had to shift and pivot. Uh, we very quickly moved all of our classes to a live streaming uh, type of program. Uh, we were streaming live to Facebook, but now we stream to a YouTube channel and provide that link. Um, we can do that either, either as a free program or as a paid program. And you know, our, our, our mission talks about the word connection and that to me just became this really important word in the last several months is how are we connecting with people. Um, there's some real benefits and bright sides to the virtual cooking classes that we're doing. We are welcoming kids and families from all over the country um, instead of just from our small town and, um, and cooking with kids, you know, in their own kitchens, um, which has been really special. Uh, cooking with adults in their kitchens as well. This was a pickle making class that we did um, with, with, um, with adults and with kids. Um, we've also found a real need to help families and adults and, and people in general to connect with nature now and like the certainty of nature um, that is um, so important in a very uncertain world. We know that the Plants are going to grow when they grow. We know that you know the seasons are going to change um, throughout the year, and there's something really um, sort of stabilizing about that. And so we did provide over the summer lots of opportunities for families to come harvest, um, to be part of the farm. But we also kind of expanded our idea of what that looked like. And so we also had plein air painting set up on the farm. Uh, families could reserve an easel and some paints, and we would set it up in various areas to. Um, just give them an opportunity to be outside and sort of observe and, and, and um, connect with nature. We were running yoga classes for middle schoolers and dance programs on the farm, uh, which, which sort of veered away a little bit from our core mission in terms of cooking and, and uh, farming, but was, was really important um, as we dealt with the, the pandemic and continue to deal with the pandemic. Um, we continue to run our programs virtually for now and are, um, are, are doing a lot of work uh, with teachers. There was a question in the chat about um, what we're hearing from teachers. At the beginning of the school year, we found there was a little bit of resistance just as they got used to um, the virtual format. But now we are starting to get, as teachers I think are settling into what is the new normal, we are starting to get a lot more requests for virtual field trips. Um, which we've started to do. We are pushing into classrooms through their Google Meets and, um, and also starting to work on lesson plans and curriculum development that blends a virtual and in-person experience. And so in some ways we see this last nine months as an, we've, we've scaled. We were such a small organization at just three years old and we've just kind of been forced to scale up in, a, in unexpected and 
in some ways, really positive ways. Thanks, Jen, and thanks for putting the links down there. I think you have a great newsletter as well, so if, if people want to join that, that's another way to stay tuned, stay, stay in touch with Jen. Um, Lusanda, tell us about Dream Factory Foundation. Oh, still muted, Lusanda, start again. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> um, you know, I want to start my introduction with um, just of you, everyone had, having this picture of a city girl turned farm girl and, you know, have been like the, the, the outcast with friends, family, not understanding what you're doing. And, you know, when I was um, back home here in South Africa and um, the only spaces after being in, at home for so long with lockdowns and the only spaces where we could go was farm, um, um, like farm uh, activities and you know the outdoor spacing the community the sharing and you know like in december it really dawned on me why we are doing what we're doing you know why what we're doing is so important so i want to first like really um say kudos and congrats to the people in this space you know like we really were like the outcasts and who who knew that now you'd be like at center stage providing people spaces for them to be, to breathe, to feel human again, to feel loved again. So for me, um, the kind of farms that we deal with in Botswana are farmers who are focused on rain-fed farming and then also are subsistence farmers. So our adopt a village concept is about adopting a village where we are dealing with um, low-income community members who are not working in the city or come to the city sparingly, but predominantly there is some form of education, but it's not enough. I don't know the value of what it is that they carry. So at the moment, we have one village that we've adopted in Chakalas 2 in, um, in, in Botswana. And what we do is we lease a land because in Botswana, the government gives every citizen of Botswana has the right to, to farm land and also residential land. So what we do is we, we've partnered with one and we also focus on women. So we lease the land from a citizen of Botswana. We develop that land because they don't have the economic means to be able to develop it. We develop that land and are very much intentional about what are the things that the community needs to be inspired to see of what is possible. So like I said, in the village, for example, the farmers focus only will plow when it's raining season, which started in December here in South Africa and Botswana. So what we did is that we put in a water system um, through piping from a dam into the farm to show them you can be a farmer all year round. So it's basically showing them the impossible is possible that they can do. And so the villages are the one who've been helping us develop the farm. So we're developing the farm literally from ground up, from clearing the trees. You know, we, the land that we get is not this beautifully um, mourned. No, the trees, it's as rough as rough can be. So from clearing those, bush clearing is the villages. You know, um, our farm, we're focusing on beef farming and also um, vegetable farming as well. So even, um, for example, like, and the thing with me, right, I'm learning as I go. Like, for example, how I met Vera was, I was in this conference and I'm learning from other farmers as well. So for example, last year, I put in beehives from the city and they just all absconded only to not think, ah, Lucinda, why don't you continue to practice what you preach and collect the bees in the village? You know, they're used to the farm life, they're used to the harsh terrains and those hives are remaining and it's the villages that are helping me to get the, those hives. So they'll tell me, you know, because many of them also, they have, um, they hide goats you know, and so they know where the holes, where the bees are. And we're making these discoveries together about the value of that that's maintained within that village. So even the houses that we're building, you know, you know um, uh, Jen Rebecca or Jennifer, who knows showing us about the yellow house, they are the ones building the, 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 the yellow house. So we're in that process together. So the terms it is about um, adopting a village and seeing that village come alive in a way that it didn't before, but using its own resources. And you know, I was so proud the other day is that we started to, um, to harvest this vegetable called rape. It looks like a spinach. 
And um, as I was harvesting it, I went into the village and I noticed that one of the villagers um, was having a funeral. The father passed away. And so the, the, the rape that was harvested from the garden was now feeding and was contributing to the funeral in the village. And so it's, it's building an ecosystem, but helping them to realize, for me, you know, the turning point for me, I read a book from a journalist um, from the UK. Um, it's titled Africa. It's a thick book. And um, it narrates how Africans basically, um, in a way, set tools down to farming, looked at farming, degraded it because they felt that the city promised them better things. The mines promised them better things, only to go to the farms and be limited to a meager wage. You know, and that's how you supported your, your, your family. And yet with farming, now you're able to, yes, you can work here, but with what you have, you're able to feed your family. So for me, this project is about restoring, like I like the one of the comments someone said, it's like going back to the land. It's a clarion call for me as an African to tell whatever space I'm allowed to be in to say, let's go back to the land. The city is not all gold. You have green within. And so we're using this modeling of building together as a community from the ground up and showing what is possible and then feeding the village as we go. So we're still in developing, growing phases. I'm learning as I go. But these are the beautiful benefits and the stories that um, I've been able and are privileged to be a part of um, since starting this journey last year. Thank you so much, Lasanda. So now we're gonna travel from Botswana to the northeast corner of Vermont to beautiful Craftsbury Common to hear from Tony and Gwyneth about Sterling College. All right, so I think Tony is sharing the screen there. Um, so we're gonna give kind of tag team this introduction and try to cover all the bases. And I think like everyone there, there's so much we'd like to say, but um, you know, give us a nudge if we're going over time. Um, so Sterling College is in Craftsbury Common in Vermont's Northeast Kingdom, one of the three northeasternmost counties in Vermont. Um, we are on unceded Abenaki land, like many others in this area. Um, and our um, campus mission is to advance ecological thinking and action through affordable experiential learning that prepares people to be knowledgeable, skilled, and responsible leaders in the communities in which they live. Um, our motto is working hands, working minds. And so uh, we are a four-year accredited college um, offering a degree in ecology, sustainable agriculture, um, environmental humanities, outdoor education, as well as self-designed majors. Um, most of what you want to know about Sterling, you can probably find out on our website and there'll be a link at the end. So I'm gonna try to focus my time on some of the things that you wouldn't necessarily know from visiting our website and some of the things that I think define our particular brand of agricultural education. So here are a few statistics about our campus. We have about 37 acres of farmland in production. Um, that's part of a approximately 135 acre campus. Almost three acres of that is gardens. We produce about 30% of the food that we consume on campus, all inclusive. Um, we're a federally recognized work college, which means unlike a work study program, all of the students work on campus for around 80 hours per semester, and that contributes to their financial aid award. Uh, the farm itself carries about 1200 hours of student work each semester, and we employ about 20% of the student body. Around 60% of the student body will complete farm chores at some point during the year for one week. Um, we run a CSA that has 30 members currently and help to support and provide food security in our local community. We grow over 60 crops each year. We have about 20 ewes that lamb more than 30 lambs each spring. We also have uh, poultry and pigs 
on the farm and we do uh, a good portion of our farm work with draft animals. We currently have a team of two halfling or draft ponies and we compost 100% of the food waste that we produce minus a few apple cores that sneak into the trash. Unmute yourself, Tony. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so our audience, um, perhaps obviously, is um, undergraduate students, uh, undergraduate college students, uh, but they come from a pretty wide range of backgrounds. You know, some are, you know, quote unquote, traditional students in that kind of age range you would expect. Others are, you know, in various places in life. Some are returning students. Uh, we have some veterans. We have a good bit of international re representation in our student body as well. Um, so it's a pretty diverse group of students. They are all kind of um, at varied points also in their academic careers. Uh, many of them are first time first year students, but many of them also are transfers coming to hear from other institutions with previous experience. Um, some of them are pursuing, you know, second degrees. Um, they also likewise those particularly who uh, uh, major in sustainable agriculture and food systems which Gwyneth mentioned is one of four majors we offer at the college beside and in addition to self-design majors um, are at varied points in that journey as well you know some have a lot of experience in uh, agriculture or in food we have people who've worked in you know the food industry for a long time or people who've worked on farms for a long time and some who are brand new to to any of those endeavors um, so they're at various uh, points along along that uh, along that journey. Um, our audience too, I would say to some extent, somewhat lesser an extent, but it are some of our community partners as well. And we'll return to this later, but we uh, we do maintain partnerships uh, with several sort of uh, regional affiliates, um, including the Nulhegan Band of the Abenaki Tribe, with whom we have partnered on a, a seed rematriation project that has become a big part of um, my personal focus and some of my students focus as well. Um, in terms of kind of meeting students where they are, and for some reason I can't advance the slides here. There we go. Um, so people are in varied points in that journey. What we can offer at Sterling because we're a land-based institution, we have, you know, it's a, a truly farm-based educational program. Uh, so students can experience kind of the full range of food production and that includes uh, quite literally from planting seeds to uh, in this case this is a heritage wheat that we grow red five wheat um, that we plant from seed with students we uh, process using traditional and contemporary techniques when when we can but from you know understanding the kind of history of production the culture of production and then finally producing um, um, end products like you know a loaf of sourdough bread from uh, the seeds that we planted in the field. So this kind of circular education, uh, looking at the totality of not only of crops, but food systems uh, largely, writ large rather, is kind of where we start. Great, so uh, the next question is to describe something that's unique about our organization's culture. And the first thing I wanted to talk about is that Sterling is still a community that can fit in one room. So pre-COVID, this was a common occurrence. It happened about three times a day that the entire community gathered together to eat in this space, which is the Dunbar Dining Hall. Um, and I think that provides us with a, a level of communication and community interaction that is unusual in a four-year college. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the work program. And I think much of what the work program brings to the college is what keeps me engaged and excited about my work. It really um, occupies that gray space between academics and work and, and makes it so that that space is the concentration rather than um, sort of a, uh, a dividing line between those two things. Um, I think that the completion of meaningful tasks provides the deepest clearest, most complete understanding of some of our basic drives as humans, or um, you know, the purposes that evolution has instilled in us to procure food, to eat, to find and provide shelter, and to engage in the broad range of skills that help us arrive at success in those things each year. 
Um, it's a place that affords the simple luxuries of community interaction, cooperative work, creative problem solving, and immersion in the natural world through a diversity of tasks. And I get to share in that every day through my work, and that's what really um, keeps me coming back, and I think it's what keeps students engaged and allows uh, people who might not flourish in a traditional academic setting to really find their path and to show what they're good at and, and that through that whole diversity of skills that they bring. And so finally, and also um, keeping in mind to allow plenty of time for, um, for, for Connor, um, I'll jump through this fairly quickly. So this is as if you, you know, you're on campus somewhat of a virtual tour. So our, our campus farm is really divided into two major sectors. We kind of have the livestock side of the farm and the uh, crop side of the farm. Uh, we're going to start again. I'll make this as brief as possible on the livestock side of the farm. Um, as Gwyneth mentioned, you know, we have pigs, we have sheep, we have chickens. Uh, we have historically had cattle, though we're kind of moving away from cattle because of the nature of our land. Uh, we also maintain a draft animal power program, which is uh, one of the images you see here is our uh, lately retired team of working Durham oxen. Um, students can minor in draft animal power. Um, so this is the livestock side of the farm. Uh, the upper aerial picture is sort of, you know, that larger area. That's the biggest part of our kind of concentrated, uh, biggest part of our land base, I guess, devoted to agriculture. Um, and this is the upper gardens area, we call it. And as Gwyneth also mentioned, this is about three acres in uh, diversified vegetable production, as well as a secondary area that we devote to um, seed uh, stewardship projects and um, heritage garden projects, including the partnership with uh, the Avenek that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think I'll, I'll leave it at that in, in the interest of time. Great. And the, the last thing we were going to talk about is one thing you need to know that you might not learn through uh, visiting the website, and that is if you visit, you should bring your farm footwear. Keep that in mind. I wonder if that's true for all panelists who are, who are speaking today. I think it is. Yeah. Um, Connor, take us to New York City and tell us about Farm School. For sure. Um, thank you for welcoming me and, and thanks to all the other panelists for, for sharing about your organizations. Um, so I'm here representing Farm School NYC again. And our mission is to uh, train folks in New York City in urban agriculture in order to build self-reliant communities inspiring positive local action around food access and social, economic, and racial justice issues. And so that is the, the core of our work of really providing urban agriculture training for folks in the New York City area and grounding ourselves in food justice and food sovereignty as the, the core of our work. Um, so folks in our communities are uh, primarily low income folks, um, folks from communities of color, um, LGBTQ folks, immigrants, and we're all working together in order to achieve collective liberation within the food world and the agriculture world. Um, so we're weaving in these concepts uh, of social justice in addition to our, our urban agriculture training um throughout our our curriculum so our main program is a certificate program that um, folks apply to and we have had a one and two year program uh, where folks move throughout the seasons um learning things like um training and, and education pedagogy food justice and botany in the winter time currently and then moving through the spring into propagation uh growing soils uh, things with irrigation in the summer and crop management into preparing for winter and um, small farm planning and design uh, uh, in the fall in order to plan for the next season. So our curriculum kind of mirrors the growing seasons as we're um, moving throughout the year. Uh, we also have offered individual courses and other um, public programming and hope to be doing more of that in the future. Um, I think something that's really special about our organization as a nonprofit in New York City is to 
uh, think about the the genesis of our organization as one uh, based in communities and based out of all of the assets that already existed in the communities that we work in in New York City. So uh, the founders, co-founders of Farm School um, in the years prior to 2010 were getting together and thinking about all of the organizations and, and farms and gardens and growing sites and knowledge that already existed in New York City and thinking about how we could bring all of that together in a way that uh, synthesizes those existing assets and uh, build upon that to offer something new for a comprehensive training program in New York City. And so I think that that method of approach of thinking about what our communities already have as opposed to what they're lacking is something that is uh, pretty key for the way that we uh, think and plan at Farm School and really um, immerse ourselves in, in thinking about uh, mindsets of abundance um, here. So I think other aspects that really describe like our organizational and community culture at Farm School is one based uh, in trust and in uh, community dialogue, talking through conflict as and when it manifests and, and just really having a, like, a, a container of space that we move in because we actually don't have a growing space ourselves. We work with growing sites around New York City in order to uh, partner to teach our courses and visit their sites. Uh, so that another unique aspect is our, our flexibility and, and nimbleness to create a container of space within the program participants and teachers and folks that we're working with in communities. And one way we do that is by talking about community agreements so just what are the things that people need in order to show up in space together as we're working with so many diverse folks from all walks of life in New York City. Um, the majority of our board, staff, faculty, and student body are all uh, communities of color and people of color as we're centering um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in our mission is uh, a very specific focus for our community. Um, so things things that you may need to know that you might not find on our website uh, when thinking about farm school is uh, we do we do all sorts of like embodied practices. Um, we check in with groundings at the beginning of our courses. Um, we we really focus on connecting with. Uh, and encouraging folks to connect with their personal ancestry and, and in order to think about how all of that connects to like understanding the land that we are on and what is known as New York City and thinking about um, all of those overlayered histories um, as they're woven into our, our farming curriculum. Um, so I will I will pause there for now and really want to make space amongst panelists and, and for folks as well, just to hear what people are really interested in. And yeah, I'll turn it back over to, to Vera. Thank you. Um, this is one of these sessions where if we're leaving you with more questions than answers, then we're doing our job, right? Because we're getting you to think, to question, to wonder, and we hope that we'll get to see you again at a future Farm-Based Education Network event or by email, or you're welcome to reach out with um, any of the panelists, as you mentioned earlier. So I'm just going to drop the Farm-Based Education Network link and my email address into the chat box. Does that go out? Oh, let's see. Uh, and I want to pass it off to Lisa for a close. And thank you so much to the panelists for joining us today, for making the time, and for just sharing who you are and, and what you're what you're working on right now. Thank you so much, Vera. And thanks for sharing all those wonderful stories. Um, the panelists have been doing an incredible job and Vera also have been doing an incredible job of keeping up with the questions coming into Q&A. So, so if you put in a question and you're wondering what the answer is, go to the Q&A box now and look in the answer tab and you may see it there and feel free to continue to drop in questions. I see there's a few that haven't been answered. Um, Vera and the moderators have agreed to stick around for a few more minutes and continue to, to answer questions. Um, I'm gonna say some closing remarks, which is that we're,
keeping these monthly gatherings going. And next month on uh, February 17th, we're going to be talking about agritourism within the US racial justice movement. And we've got some amazing speakers who will be sharing their experiences. And that, that is gonna be focused on the US because you know, things are complicated enough here in the US. We didn't wanna try to tackle other countries' uh, racial justice issues as well. Um, however, come March 16th, we are starting to move around the world a little more and we're gonna be exploring the diversity and impact of agritourism in Southern Africa. So you got a taste of that today with Lusanda and we'll be hearing about um, more stories and on more adventures um, in other countries in, in um, Southern Africa. And then we've got more planned um, that will take us through May um, for recordings, resources, and registration all for these upcoming webinars. All of that information is posted on the website, www.agritourismworkshop.com. I will follow up with an email, or actually, actually the emails come from Becky Bartlett. Um, so you'll get an email from Becky within a few days. It will have the recording from today, as well as many of the resources and links um, that folks mentioned. And we'll be putting their, their slides, their presentations, and the recording and resources all on this website. So we're now gonna stop the recording and for you, for those of you who are interested in sticking around for a few more minutes, feel free to hang out a little longer and um, we'll continue to answer your questions in the Q&A.